In the 34th episode of their 2017 Let's Play series of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, popular YouTubers The Game Grumps, Aaron Hansen, and Daniel Avedin approached the Rito Village, triggered a cinematic, and had the following exchange. Yeah, like, this is cool and all. I kind of wish this wasn't there, though. What do you mean? Well, it's, it just it just draws a lot of attention to it, and it makes it feel like, oh, I'm supposed to do this. Oh, I, I love it, dude. This is the shit that I was talking about that makes it feel like the scale is so grand to me. But the, I don't know. It's the opposite for me. Huh. It makes it feel small because, like, the designers clearly are like, this is what you're supposed to do right. in this giant world. Let's put a pin in this for now. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is famous for, among other things, being a huge departure from its contemporary 3D Zelda titles by being, well, basically a complete opposite game. Where Skyward Sword was rigidly linear, with the sandship coming after the ancient cistern, but before the fire sanctuary, Breath of the Wild allows the player to do any number of the dungeons in any order that they want before fighting the final boss. Where Ocarina of Time has one path up Death Mountain, Breath of the Wild has infinity paths, and a lizard. All of this comes together to present a thesis of gameplay. What the game is mechanically about. A character role that the game assumes as it speaks to the player, an attitude by which it forms a relationship with them an aesthetic of indifference. Taking a detour to Dark Souls, which by now has become tradition here on the Charles Goodrich YouTube channel, there are several locations that the player may encounter an illusory wall. Just as it sounds, it's a wall that looks like it's there, but if we roll into it or attack it, it will fade away and reveal treasure, bonfires, or a dark wraith. Now, like many mechanics in Dark Souls, this is never tutorialized in a conventional way. It's just found through trial and error, and if you never find out about it, then, well, screw you. Now, of course, there are plenty of other things that are not at all intuitive about the Soulsborne Die Twice games. Enemies will ambush you, bosses will use attacks that you might not even know they have, mimics exist, stats, the attunement system, upgrading gear, all of this is something that you're going to have to get to grips with, because you put the work in. Developer From Software isn't just going to refuse to hold your hand, it will chop it off if you dare stick it out at all. It's almost as if they don't care in the slightest about your experience in this obtuse world. But that's not true, is it? Any fan of this style of game will tell you that a lot of care went into how this game was crafted. Traps and ambushes that are unlikely to kill the player are established early on to raise awareness of the presence of this kind of feature. Enemies and bosses have telegraphs that will eventually just click with you. And while you may have your ass brutally handed to you by early encounters, by the time that you're getting the Lord Souls, you know how to approach with caution, such that even if you don't know what attack is coming, you can piece together how to create a contingency plan for it. Like any good tsundere, the game is only pretending to not care about your experience, when it actually does quite a bit. It's just that the experience that they want you to have is one where the player feels like it is only because of their own resourcefulness that they succeeded against the odds that they face. And it should be said that this isn't all or nothing. Designers can choose to what level their games are indifferent in presentation. About a third of the way through Dark Souls, there's this rather nasty place that you visit called Blight Town. Maybe you've heard of it. In the swamp at the bottom of this area, there's a large tree that the player can crawl their way into, inside of which you'll find a plank shield, which is disappointing to say the least. Now at this point in the game, the player has likely not had many opportunities to discover the existence of illusory walls. Behind the plank shield is one such wall hiding a humanity, a fairly decent and rare item at this point in the game. Now a reasonable human being would say, nice secret, I feel very smart and satisfied. But the deranged people who play the game naked with the whip will be rightfully distrustful of Fromsoft and roll through the illusory wall behind the illusory wall and find the Great Hollow. An entire optional area full of enemies that drop rare items, loot in challenging to reach areas, and even a unique and very useful ring. That's not even half of it though, because at the end of this area is another, this time lore relevant optional area with a mini boss, the ending to a side quest, and a covenant. This is also like one of three areas in the game that just has background music. It wasn't a small amount of work that went into this space being present in the game, and without a guide it's very unlikely that the player will even know that it exists. It reeks of, yeah, we put this here and it's cool. We don't care if you get to see it at all though. Get good. And it's exactly this oppressive feeling, this overbearing sense of crypticness, that scratches the itch had by those who love these games. It doesn't have to be all mean-spirited in its presentation though. Returning at last to Breath of the Wild, Nintendo has employed much of what Dark Souls does, but with a much different tone. This time around, Hyrule is a vast kingdom of seemingly endless wonder. The player is so often driven by simple questions like, what's that thing over there? 
The game lets go and allows the player to do as they please. Don't want to go to Kakariko Village? Well that's fine, you can just go straight to the Divine Beasts. And if you don't want to do that, then you can just kill Ganon whenever, there's no prerequisite. And for those of us for whom defeating the big bad himself was not a high priority, there's plenty of shrines, side quests, and Korok seeds to occupy our time with. You might be walking through a forest, when suddenly a rock gets up and starts to fight you with very little pomp or circumstance. In any other 3D Zelda, the game would have stopped and had a little cutscene where the big rock monster pops out of the ground and has a title card appear or something. It's amazing what a tiny change like not taking control away from the player or even focusing on such things happening has. Not only for pacing of gameplay, but for conveying an aesthetic to the player. It's like the game is a character itself. It acts consistently to establish its personality and motivations to the player. And when maintained, the player will form a specific relation to it, because unlike most media, in games the player is also an actor. Consider it an improv set that the game is leading the player on. The game starts up and pitches the premise of the skit to the player who then, as all great improv actors do, says, yes and. And if the game is good, it will have its own appropriate yes and to return. This goes back and forth, and that's, in very very short, gameplay. Now imagine what would happen if your improv partner dropped character in the middle of your routine together. It'd be completely jarring, wouldn't it? You'd have to swerve with them, and you might even feel as if you can't trust the character they were trying to establish before, or that you misinterpreted what they were going for. It creates a feeling of confusion and discomfort. Just like how it would be if you were playing a game where on the one hand you were doing something mundane such as crossing a canyon, and you hear some mysterious music crossfade in, an updraft appears beneath your feet and fireballs come towards you from off screen. You turn the camera to see where they're coming from and it's a giant dragon! And on the other hand you're walking up to a city when you get stopped in your tracks. You hear a screech, the camera fades out, and a cinematic showing off this really cool bird mech, seriously it's so cool, pay attention to it, we really care that you pay attention to the thing. Well. You get my point. Breath of the Wild takes such care to come across as the type of slick, cool customer that doesn't care what you think of it. It knows it's awesome, and you're welcome to check it out, but it's not going to beg for your attention. It's your loss if you don't notice. Now, of course, Nintendo does want you to notice, even when it's not presenting itself that way. It just nudges you in very subtle ways. In that same episode of Game Grumps, Aaron goes on to say how cool it would have been if you didn't notice it at all, and then suddenly this giant shadow passes over you, pulling your attention to it simply by it being there. My takeaway from this is that Nintendo was scared. It can be terrifying to make a game with such a big scope and not have the work be noticed. It's common to want the people who see our work to see every inch of it so that our time as developers wasn't wasted. It's common to want the player to see the cool bird necks that we put in our games, but that doesn't work for every piece. In games where the aesthetic goal of the work isn't this affability towards the player, showing off all the spectacle in the world is good. In the Uncharted franchise, characters spend half the game commenting on how great the view is, and it's perfectly in line with the tone of those games. But in games as standoffish as Breath of the Wild, this feels less like trying to find a middle ground and more like an actor flubbing their lines. Finally, let's take a lesson from Team Charity developers of Hollow Knight and its sequel, Silk Song, which I am massively anticipating. In his video on the game, Mark Brown reports that the devs do not worry too much about whether everyone will see the content that it makes. That, quote, just having it there, out of sight from most players, makes the world feel more truly alive. Mark also had this to say, Ultimately, it is quite incredible to stumble down some random hallway, and not just uncover a handy item or whatever, but an entirely unique boss fight that some players might never see. Making a game that has an aesthetic of indifference about it is all about restraint. And even if you're terrified that people are going to miss something that you put an incredible amount of effort into, to those who love this aesthetic like myself, it's so worth it to let it get missed by some people, so that when it is discovered, players feel like the world is so much bigger than they are. Hey, just want to say thanks to all you folks out there who listened to this. I had a lot of fun making it as usual, I hope you had a lot of fun listening to it. Uh, make sure to hit all those things, the bell icon, subscribe button, like, leave a comment, all the things that people usually ask you to do at the end of YouTube videos. I've also linked my Curious Cat and Twitter below, follow me on those and ask me your burning questions. Speaking of links in the description, I also have a Patreon. Patreon's a bit of extra money for me, and hopefully great fun for you. Patrons get to be in my credits, see my process, listen to my stupid bloopers that I do not actually have for this one because none of them ended up funny, sorry guys. Uh, and top tier patrons get to vote on what my next topic's gonna be and also get to be shouted out like this. Thanks to Andrew Loomer, Brad Goodrich, Nikolai Carpathia, and 3 eyed P. Alright, well that's it for me, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.